Thanks for that, Charlie. Um, Graham Anderson from Agriculture Victoria. So our session today really is looking at this big topic of what's the season up to? And given uh, the sort of billion dollar impacts from one year to the next of when we have big years or, or crook years, um, really exploring this role of seasonal forecasting. The session we've got, we've got um, myself with the intro, Dale Gray who heads up the break newsletter um, in Victoria. He's here. Dale's an agronomist, so both of our talks will be coming from the agricultural side of things. Um, and we've spent, you know, the best part of the last 10 years making sense of seasonal forecasts and climate and where this stuff can be used and where it can't. We then go into a 30 minute workshop where you're going to be looking at seasonal forecast products that are currently there on, you know, international websites. Uh, and you're in your table so that you can look at your part of the world. And we're going to look at the May forecasts for this year and you're going to see what they were saying in May and, uh, and then do a bit of a check to see, well, this is what actually happened, so how did they compare? And then we'll, it'll context for um, looking at the, the forecast from here. One of the key bits is that, that reading these maps and forecast maps isn't that straightforward. So on quite a lot of occasions, um, people in agriculture are disappointed because they're looking at the map and reading the wrong thing from it. So, so that's the challenge today. Um, the next bit, um, as always, if in doubt, you should consult a doctor. So that's why we've got um, Andrew Watkins here from the Bureau to, to bring home that final session and a panel discussion. <coughs> so seasonal variability has always been a big part of uh, Australian farming, and this is um, Australian wheat production uh, starting back at the 60s. And you can see, and you guys live this, um, it's always been variable. Um, and as we saw last year, you know, when everything goes right, you know, we've got all of this, the best of our genetics, the best of our agronomy. Um, uh, when everything kicks in, we can produce more food than ever before, you know, and um, farmers and supply chains and advisors, everyone plays a key role in that. Um, but bad is still bad, basically. So when it doesn't, when you don't add water, uh, all of that great stuff we've done is for, for nil. And it's just interesting to me that um, when you look at that uh, longer term, um, uh, you know, there's the potential difference between bad and things bottom out, and Australia as a country has had a, you know, that's not raining anywhere, as opposed to, say, last year when we've all had a cracker. There's a bit of a gap there about, well, what are you trying to plan for? Now, this happens at a farm level, but also at a supply chain level, about which are we planning for? There's a big difference there between our best and a potential best and potential worst. And I guess, um, you know, talking to, in the Victorian situation, we'd look at the Wimmera, 2015 was a shocker. Um, you know, there wasn't a lot of fertiliser needed that year. And I can imagine the discussions that happened at the end of the year um, along the supply chain where people caught with too much stock and uh, the bean counter saying, listen, don't do that again. Now, the very next year, the Indian Ocean dipole was in its wet phase. The, uh, and, you know, this is a one in 20 year event to capitalise on. And so that relies on not only the farmers having everything ready to go, but also the supply chain there to support that. And it was interesting that we did a Twitter survey in um, 2015 and uh, two out of three farmers said they'd had trouble getting uh, inputs, um, whether it was fertiliser or fungicides, to, to deal with this massive season. So it puts a lot of pressure, not just at the farm level, but right along all of the brave people uh, who are making calls about, well, what are we planning for this year, from one year to the next? And is there, uh, is there a chance that season forecasting can help give us a bit of a heads up? So that's what we're going to try and um, share with you today. And when we talk about forecasting, and we do you know, about 100 sessions a year, um, Dale and I, with uh, uh, farmers around the place, there's three things that normally pop up. People say, we want better forecasts. Well, um, do you think the forecasts are getting better? Yes. Yeah. So, you know, what we've got on our phones and when you look at whether it's seven day forecasts or whatever, they do get better. I'm really glad we've got the West Australians up the front here because uh, it's not so we can keep an eye on you because they're going to support us and ask good questions. So thank you. Um, so forecasts are getting better and there's bigger computers, more data getting fed into them, so that's all good. Um, but that's not all. One of the key things is uh, better climate literacy so we actually understand what's coming out of the forecasts. That's a really key one because there's a, a, a lot of people's disappointment with forecasts is often to do with misinterpretation. Um, the other bit is um, it doesn't matter what the forecast does, it's well what decisions people make with it. Now that's what you're good at, that's what farmers are good at. 
So really, this session today is really looking at this literacy thing just to try and make sure we understand when and where these forecasts can be of a bit of value. So we need all of those things happening. So a bit of a quick recipe. So if you're on MasterChef and the special uh, ingredient tonight is we're going to make rain, there's only there's two really key things we need to make rain. So does anyone know what they are? Two really key things to make rain. Without them, you haven't got a chance. Water. <laughs> water, that's right. Well, um, you're quite right, water. But before you get to the water bit, I think you're looking up in the air. What do you need in the air? Yeah. So, what's in the clouds? What's the clouds made up of? Moisture. Yep, moisture. Right. So you've got to have moisture. Right. So, if you're starting off with dry air, your chance of making rain is pretty slim. Right. So you've got to have source of moisture. Now, this is just you know where it's rained in the last six months. <clears throat> but um, I remember a meteorologist telling me if all we had was moist air, it would just be humid. So something else has got to happen to make that moisture fall out. What's got to happen? Yeah, what does that? Ah, temperature, yep, right. So it's really interesting. You look at here about where it rains and you've got the, the great dividing range. You've got moisture coming in off the ocean. That moist air gets lifted up. As you go up, it gets colder, and basically that colder temperature makes rain fall out. And it's interesting, when you go on the other side of a mountain range, when air is coming down and sinking, as it's coming down, it gets warmer, can hold more moisture, and that's the sort of the rain shadow effect. So really, the rain that falls you know, over our heads is to do with some moisture's met up with some cooler air, and it's falling down on us. So, so that's the key bit, and the seasonal forecasting is largely around, uh, is this one of those seasons where there's more moisture about to feed into the rain-making process for our part of the world or not? Um, and then where are those sort of triggers for rain? So I really like this picture because it's sort of got, uh, um, you know, a lot is the Antarctica down south. You can see all the cold fronts, the conveyor belt that whizzes around the Southern Ocean, that's a Southern Annular Mode. Um, the big sources of moisture though coming out of the warm oceans up north, so the El Nino Southern Oscillation, so the Pacific Ocean is a really big source of moisture for Australia. Some years it's helpful, some years it's in a bad mood. And over here, the Indian Ocean Dipole. And so some years it's really helpful like it was last year, um, and other years it's not helpful at all. So those two up the top there are really key drivers and, and they're not active every year, but it might be every second, third or fourth year. If they're doing something, it's worth knowing about because it's saying, the supply of moisture is either about to be enhanced or it's about to be sort of cut off. And, uh, and down south for us, it's just really about where those fronts are all sitting. So a lot of what sits behind forecasts is about, well, what sort of form are these climate drivers in? And uh, we've sort of had analogies and when, when Dale, um, when we put together the break, a bit like the mobile phone in the reception when you're driving around the countryside. Sometimes you've got a five bar reception and sometimes it slips out to nothing. Well, if you talk to the, the seasonal forecasters, meteorologists, we've got some years where there's a five bar forecast and some years where it's down to nothing. And some years where they're quite confident about that five, car, five bar forecast being around for a bit longer. So part of that is trying to understand, well, what are those signals for our part of Australia? Uh, which are the bits of ocean we should be looking at? Um, so where do we find the most moisture in cloud? So if we're looking across the planet, where will, it, where will that be? Fantastic, thank you Nick. So a lot of the meteorology, especially with seasonal weather patterns, is all about looking at what's happening along the equator because it's the hottest part of the planet and if there's going to be anything a bit unusual or different happening, it's going to be because at the equator some warm water's popped up somewhere and that is where you find all of the cloud and moisture is above that. Now if that happens in the, over our part of the world, then all the moisture's heading our way. If it's happening somewhere else, then that can drag, it, drag these weather patterns out of whack. So that's what's sort of sitting behind a lot of these forecasts. And here you've got the classic sort of um, El Nino cycle um, where, you know, the warmest water's out in the east and a lot more cloud activity shifted out there. It just makes it harder to, to buy, you know, there's less moisture um, coming in on those years. And then some years it's all happening to our north. 
So that's what's sitting behind seasonal forecasts. And one of the things that when they're looking at is sea surface temperature maps. And this is a sea surface temperature anomaly map. Um, along the equator uh, is actually a lot warmer water. It's like a warm bath. And down here, it's absolutely freezing. But this is an anomaly. So it's showing, you know, these colours are where the, the water might be two degrees warmer than it normally is. And the blue colours where a bit of ocean might be uh, two degrees cooler. So this is a, a drier pattern for certainly Eastern Australia. Um, September 06, it's one of those bomb out years from a wheat point of view. El Nino over in the Pacific, warmest waters popped up there. Um, there's extra cloud and everything happening. But you'll notice over to the north of Australia, those cooler SSTs there. So more moisture is happening out here, less happening here. And there'd be more clear skies and everything and the trade winds would be heading the wrong way. And all of that is not helpful for us. Now, if you look um, at this sort of area just to the north of Australia, and we'll do, um, say, uh, uh, spring 2010 for East Australia, just see if you notice any difference. So there's the difference. So a lot of the seasonal forecasts are saying, well, where's this warmest water going to pop up? So back there, you know, there was some, uh, in that spring, plenty of moisture up there. So, so a lot of the seasonal forecasts is around, is there anything major going on with these big climate drivers? So it sets off a whole train, chain of things. Um, and if we look at last year's SST from July, again you can see you know, it was really quite warm up up here. But you know, all of that, the moisture sources were set to four or five, pretty good. Um, and also for Southwest WA, you had a bit of cooler water there, which is part of that local pattern, which is really useful for you. Um, so it's interesting if you look at the bomb out years on that wheat production map, and I've just printed off the spring SST anomalies, uh, you'll notice what's common with each of those. You can see 94 was looking a bit blue, uh, 2002 was looking a bit blue there and a bit blue there in 06. So part of that seasonal forecasting thing, there's some signals there about when things are perhaps going to be less favourable and that's, the, that's what feeds into these seasonal forecasts. Um, I had a farmer say once about seasonal forecasting saying, you know, it's really a bit like getting the minutes of the, the latest Reserve Bank meeting. It's um, you know, they're, they're, it's not so much the, the prediction, but it's more the commentary which is really valuable. And quite often they haven't got much to say, but every now and then there is something there where, you know, when you, when you look at their previous forecast and then what's happened this time, you say, no, it's actually starting to happen. You can have more confidence that, you know, either the economy is going this way or that way. Um, I like the, uh, the, I'm not sure if anyone's seen it, the checkout show on the ABC, and they've got this uh, product versus pack shop. <coughs> where, you know, this is what's on the product and uh, open it up and that's what's in the, inside the package. I always get a bit of a giggle out of that. Mm -hmm. um, but it's interesting from a seasonal forecast point of view, I think it's really important, our own expectations, because we're often looking at this, looking at a forecast map and thinking, you beauty, and then three months later, we've sort of, we've had to deal with that, thinking, well, you know, there's a bit of a difference there. So that's why a really big cautionary tale about getting our expectations right of what a forecast can and can't do. Um, a nutritionist would say that, yeah, well, the corn is there, the corn is there, the lentils are there, the sour cream's there. It's, it's officially right, but our expectations really expect two different things from those two sides. So, so our own expectations is important. And I've got a couple of one-liners here which we've collected over the last 10 years, I guess, which, uh, which I think are, are useful about how people use them. And, um, you know, make decisions on what's knowable first, which... You know, most of our agronomists everyone does, you know, soil moisture, what's in the bank, all the other stuff. That's the place to start. Seasonal forecasts are a value add, okay? Um, all options are possible at any time, but some seasons a pattern can change the odds of what's more likely. Uh, best to, I'm uh, sorry, a 70% chance of wetter than normal is the same as a 30% chance of drier. So um, there's a lot of people, if you, if you see a 70% chance of wetter, that lock it in is going to be wet. But... Uh, actually, 30% chance of something going the other way is still significant enough. So it's important to know what the map is you're looking at and what it's actually saying. Um, best to squint your eyes when you're looking at a forecast map. It's the vibe you're after. Now, as some of these maps get better and more accurate, um, I think if you're looking at it in your district saying, oh, the Wimmera's going to be wet, but the Melly isn't, you're looking too close. You need to hold these back because it's really about these are big big climate drivers, and it's about your sort of part of the world. Is it looking at a dry pattern or weather? Um, individual weather events will decide whether the Mallee gets something or the Wimmera gets it, but this seasonal forecasting is more about that bigger scale, and we'll be having a crack at that in a minute. 
Um, the commentary that, that sits behind the forecast is, is really a key bit, and, and that's why a lot of people look at the map, but just spend a bit of time for that extra paragraph or two about what it's saying. Um, <clears throat> I've heard this one, one, just one weather event can bugger up a good seasonal forecast, and that's what we always hope for when there's a dry forecast, and you can crack one decent event that has made the season, and that's what farming's all about, and you're um, backing your judgement. But seasonal forecasts, you know, uh, that's the pre the set up conditions for the year. Individual weather events determine whether that'll happen or not. Um, a key one on literacy, knowing which climate drivers affect your regions, big droughts and wet periods. Um, that's been better known than ever before. Um, as to where climate change fits in, climate change will turn up one week, month, season, at a year at a time. So seasonal forecasting is still uh, only, only going to become more important, especially when you know a bit of warmer water than we've seen before pops up at a key part of your place, you can see sort of more moisture coming in. And uh, all models have got value, and so we think it's useful to look at a bunch of different models rather than just one opinion. So part of what the workshop is will be doing that. So thanks, well, I'm not sure if um, uh, one of our the sponsors has sort of helped with some of the extension on this is a Managing Climate Variability Program, so I'm just gonna give it a plug. It's got a range of industry partners in there, works pretty closely with the BOM and climate researchers on making sure that this stuff does get in the hands of people who are making the big decisions, like you guys. And uh, if you ha don't get the Victorian the break that Dale does every month, um, there's the email, it'll pop out free. And also, with um, what Dale's going to share is the, the forecast product he looks at when he puts together the break. And while we do that for Victoria, and it's got a pretty big following, um, we'd be quite happy to help work with anyone who wants to, say, do that for WA or Queensland or what else. We, um, you know, happy to train you up. So that's part of the, the course.